so um, I wanted to tell you about Gaussian process regression. Um, if you want to follow along in the tutorial, um, go to the MIND 2018 repository and git pull, and then go to the tutorials, super EEG directory, and then run the GP demo ECOG notebook. Um, and the tutorial is entirely self-directed, so there's a bunch of background reading, and then all you do to run it is run all cells, okay? And that'll just run through. And so, it, so you just kind of go through it and run it yourself. Um, but, uh, so I don't want to go through the whole thing because you can do it on your own time and ask me questions as it comes up. Um, but I wanted to tell you what Gaussian process, like what Gaussian processes are and Gaussian process regression is. Um, not only as it applies to this example, but just in general. Um, and I thought we could just talk about it for between zero and five to fifty, like let's say zero minutes up until possibly 1.45. And then we'll stop. And if you have more questions, come find me, but I'll be hackathoning in my lab. Okay. So who knows what a Gaussian distribution is? Or does anyone know? What no? We'll start with me just explaining it, even if someone knows. I apologize if you already know what Gaussian process regression is. Uh, who knows what a Gaussian distribution is? Like, what is that? Yes. I know Ida knows, but yeah. Yeah. The, the students in particular. Yeah. Do you, what's a Gaussian? Uh, just like very generally, not. It's a distribution list of properties defined by a single set of equations. Okay, great. So it's like some sort of probability distribution. So if you have some variable x, then we could make a graph for each possible value of x along the x-axis. We could say, what's the probability of drawing a number with that value? Okay. And it looks something like this. And then it's got a mean parameter mu and a width parameter sigma, the standard deviation. And that says, like, once I know these parameters, I can say, what's the, what are the chances of drawing a number with that particular value, just by looking at what's the height of the distribution at that uh, x-axis? What about a multivariate Gaussian? So that's a univariate Gaussian. Does anyone know what univariate means? What does it mean? One variable. One variable, yes. And what is multivariate? It's very different. Many variables. Many variables. <laughs> yeah. And how does that, uh, yeah, so a way of kind of representing a normal distribution is with this kind of fancy looking n. And then, you know, here's the notation. And we might take a draw x from that distribution. What is a multivariate distribution? Like, okay, so it's multiple variables. What does that mean? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller? Bueller. Yeah, mult okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Multiple means and multiple standard deviations. Kind of, yeah. So x, instead of just a single number, x could be a vector. So if we had two dimensions, we'd have to kind of make a whole plane. And then instead of just a single bump, it would be kind of like a hill-looking thing. And then this, the peak of that hill is going to be mu. But now instead of a single number, mu is going to be a whole vector of numbers. How many numbers? Well, that's how many dimensions are in our distribution. And then the standard deviation parameter becomes tricky. So you might say, like, well, maybe you could just have number of dimension standard deviation parameters, right? But that would not sufficiently describe all possible hill shapes we could want to draw. Um, we, have to set, we have to actually turn this sigma into a matrix, which is very different. You have to uppercase sigma. That totally changes its meaning. 
instead of a single number, big sigma uh, is now a matrix that says, as you vary uh, a number in one dimension, how do you co-vary in a different dimension? So, it so uh, it's kind of a neat idea. Did, has everyone heard of covariance already? Okay. Okay. Now, that's a regular Gaussian distribution. Maybe you've played with them, maybe not. Okay. Now, what a Gaussian process is, is very similar. It's just you extend this idea to infinitely many dimensions. Okay. So I shouldn't have to explain that. No, I'm just joking. Yeah. So uh, the way that works is that it's actually very simple when you just consider like what a multivariate Gaussian is. The idea is that instead of just a single mean value or a single covariance matrix, in a Gaussian process, you replace these with a mean function, which has location parameters to it. I'll tell you what that means. And then as, as a covariance function, which, has, which is parameterized by locations. And they are tricky locations. So in some abstract representational space, that's where things kind of get tricky, uh, you can say, if here's where I'm evaluating this function, that's what its mean is, given by the mean function. And here, if I have two locations, these are how they co-vary. The trick is that whereas in an, a normal normal distribution, a non-Gaussian process normal distribution, uh, you have to predefine like x, y, z, all of your dimensions up front. And then you can say, well, what's the mean in dimension x, what's you know dimension one, and what's the covariance between dimension like a and b or one and two? In a Gaussian process, the which dimensions you're evaluating can be continuous. So I could say, like, what's the mean of dimension one point seven three, or what's the covariance between dimension, you know, two point six and three point seven? Okay. Does that make sense? It's, it's a little tricky to think about, because normally we think about dimensions themselves as kind of discrete things. But in Gaussian processes, what the dimension labels are are themselves continuous variables instead of discrete variables. OK? Does that make sense? It's tricky to think about. It's a little abstract. But that is how it works. So a location in Gaussian process land is like a set of coordinates which tells you which dimensions you're thinking about. And what's a dimension? Well, in the uh, tutorial, a, a uh, set of coordinates is a location in brain space. Oops. You all get to see my password, which is just my fingerprint. So in order to get into my computer, I have to cut off my finger and then, no. Uh, please don't. Um, OK. Um, so we often take brain recordings, and our brain recordings are taken at a discrete set of locations in, in the brain. And a typical way we might analyze brain data is to, like, you know, as various tutorials uh, that we've heard about uh, might uh, have described, you can say, let's take a brain image, like a 3D image, and string it out into a vector. And then I might get one of those vectors at each time point. So you can think of each voxel as a different dimension. And the locations of those voxels are like the 3D brain coordinates. right? And you could say, like, how do those voxels co-vary over time or over space? Well, in when we kind of extend this idea to Gaussian processes, even if we've taken measurements at a particular pre-chosen set of locations, like where our scanner voxel centers are, or where we've placed electrodes in someone's brain, or a rat's brain, or whatever, um, when we apply the Gaussian process idea to those recordings, you can then ask questions about locations at arbitrary places in space. So even if you take measurements at, a, at one set of locations, this method allows you to make inferences about any location, including places between the measurements. And essentially, the trick is to use 
spatial blurring. It's not magic. Okay? Does that make sense? Does the idea make sense? Does the idea not make sense? Well, so why do we have the assumption that it's Gaussian? Um, well, in Gaussian process regression, it's it, that it, this works via Gaussian. You could. No, on a meta level, why choose this method? Because. Oh, for relies, brain data? Given that it relies on this very specific assumption, mm. why use this one? Um, Ah. Well, I can tell you about tests that we apply, but I don't know that they're the right tests. But you can hold out data and see, like, if your guesses about what those pieces of brain are doing were actually what those pieces of brain were doing. Um, so with this, maybe I'll go to, like, kind of more specifically what the application is. So here's a map of some recordings that were taken from someone's brain. That, like, you know, each dot is the recording surface of an electrode. And that's all we know about what that person's brain is doing. Given a model of how every piece of brain covaries, which is some, well, this is a covariance function, but evaluated at a discrete set of locations so that we can plot it. Then we can say, let's pick a new set of locations that we want to evaluate this Gaussian process at, which are the places in pink. And then we can say, given that we know what's happening at the blue regions, and that we know how every piece of brain co-varies with every other piece of brain, we can solve out using this, this equation, but I don't think I have to unpack it unless you want the details. Uh, you can solve out what the locations in pink were most probably doing. And those locations in pink, critically, are not locations we recorded. Um, they're just like locations of voxel centers in a nifty image or some other brain area we want to know about. Shouldn't you? What does that mean? No, I was just saying that, like, for instance, in this picture, we just have a person who we have samples of the questions. Mm. Ah, you're picking up on an intuition that you might know the most about locations near electrodes that you actually have. Yes, that is, that is accurate. The uh, trick in this method is you have to build up that covariance model by including data from many people who have location, electrode recordings in different locations. So you have more group coverage. That's right. Across people, we kind of have coverage throughout the brain. But from any given person, we just know what a small piece of brain is doing. So by stitching together information across people, you can fill in these pink locations. Yes? Is it specifically the case that you need to have at least, say, n patients with a pair of electrodes in the same? No. Um, OK. Because, sorry, you can determine covariance across participants is what I'm asking. So if you have uh, one electrode in, in one region and in one patient, and another electrode in another region in a, in a different patient, can you actually construct covariance between those two? Uh, OK, so let me, let me just pause for a sec. I'll, let, we'll get to that. So I said I would only go to 145. If you don't want to learn about the details, then you can go hack. If you do want to learn about the details, stay here. Uh, but like, I just want to make it clear that I won't be offended or insulted if you do want to go hack. It's totally fine. But I'll stay here for a little while longer. I'll be, <laughs> should I be publicly offended? Yeah. I mean, I'll take it as a. Okay, no one, no one left. Uh, okay. <laughs> All right. I mean, whatever you guys want. Uh, I'm gonna draw stuff on the board. Here is one. In, that that kind of offer to leave at any point apply. So just like when you get bored, just leave. Okay. I can just talk forever. Well, I want to answer the other question, unless it's related. Uh, it's about the covariance matrix. So it's related, but I'll wait for you. OK, maybe I'll describe a little more, and then we can kind of get into it. OK, let's suppose that we've got three regions we care about, A, B, and C. Uh, 
Okay. Okay. And we just have two people's brains. Okay. So this is the covariance matrix we're trying to understand. So first of all, every location like is perfectly correlated with itself, so we don't really care about the diagonal. We always know what it is. Um, in person one's brain, we recorded from locations A and B. And so we can correlate the time series of A and B and understand how A and B are correlated. Okay. And in person two's brain, we know how B and C are correlated because we recorded from those two locations. So we get to fill in these places. And so here we've stitched together data across people. But then there's another kind of tricky category of pairs of locations, A and C. So those locations appeared in, like, in the union of locations in the data set, but it, we never recorded from A and C in any, in any patient. And so the additional assumption that has to go into this model is uh, spatial smoothness, which means that to the extent that C is nearby another location like B, we assume that it behaves similarly and it correlates with the rest of the brain similarly. And so it essentially ends up being the way you fill in missing locations is by taking, taking weighted averages of other parts of this covariance matrix where the weights are determined by how close in space those entries are, you know, the different pairs that go into that entry are. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah, so you could build up a, um, that's something we've played around with a little bit, is you could use a totally different data source to build up your correlation matrix. So if you wanted to ultimately know about, like, all the voxel locations in a standard MNI brain or something like that, you might take an fMRI data set where you actually can measure the covariance matrix and use that as your kind of model of how you fill in the rest of the brain. Um, and that's totally legit. Didn't that depend on what the different measures are? One is blood oxygenation level. The other one is different yes. frequency bands or ah. different single neuron rate. Yeah, there are two. OK, when I say that's totally legit, I mean you can solve out the math, and it will give you answers. Whether that corresponds to what the brain is actually doing is a separate question, and it's an empirical question. So, if you hold, so the test is if you hold out some data, predict what's happening there, are your predictions in line with what was actually happening at, at those held out brain locations? So that's the test that we use to evaluate this method, and different models are differently good at making those sorts of predictions. So what we found works pretty well is to not cross over into other domains like fMRI, but to stitch together ECOG data across different patients. And it turns out they can be doing the same task or different tasks, task dependence, even though task depend, you know, our correlation matrices change as a function of task. If you record over a long enough, uh, time window, it turns out just more data is better, is what we've kind of been seeming to find. So related to that, so yeah. for a group of participants, we only get one co uh, covariant matrix, right? So if you're assuming that the relation is really different in this case, whatever. That's exactly right. Yes, so the two kind of strong, there, there are, well, there are three strong assumptions of this model. One is that things vary over space in the same way, no matter where you are in the brain. That is, in its strictest sense, untrue. So you can, but you could imagine a more complicated model where, like, you know, you measure volume conductance properties in different brain areas, and that, or kind of spatial correlations or whatever you want in different brain areas, and use that to make a more accurate model. But we don't do that in our approach. A second thing is a second str uh, strong assumption of this model, which is also not true. So all three of the assumptions of the model are are individually not true. Uh, second is that the correlation matrix does not change over time. 
and through other work in our own lab even, we show that you can decode like which part of a movie or story someone's viewing or listening to based on their moment by moment correlation matrices. So correlation matrices do change over time and across tasks. So we're maybe capturing kind of like the average correlation matrix or the average covariance model. And then the third assumption, which is also not true, is that this approach assumes that correlation matrices are preserved across people. And we know from other work, not in our lab, but from uh, labs like uh, Marvin Chun's lab and, and others, you can do things like predict someone's IQ from the resting state correlation matrix. So there are differences in correlation matrices across people. And here we're assuming that those differences are not, uh, we're not accounting for those differences. You can imagine extending this general approach to like have time varying task dependent matrices and allow for flexibility across people. But in our implementation, uh, kind of a first pass at this, we did not need to build in that flexibility in order to make good predictions about what held out pieces of brain we're doing. But we can't predict perfectly what the entire brain is doing from just a few electrodes. And so there's a lot of room for improvement that these sorts of a, kind of fixing up the model to kind of account for these known facts about brains might help, help us to make better predictions. Yes? So when you say predictions, it depends what exactly you're predicting. It could be a very coarse measure of the activity in these other regions. It could be the ability to test precise patterns. So that, that the granularity of that prediction is also unstated. Absolutely. So the what we've done most is predict uh, our main evaluation metric is you take a uh, voltage time series of a held out electrode location and we correlate it with our prediction about what that location was doing. So it's just a single number, a correlation. So I guess I would characterize that as coarse by your metric. Um, another thing that we're starting to look at is like, can you classify what word someone's thinking of? Um, so like kind of pattern classifier sorts of analyses. Um, yeah. Can you recover, can you make a prediction for like a, a burst in power or some frequency that that? Yeah, the, that's a test, that's an empirical question. Uh, we, we've worked uh, for this model only in the time domain, um, but you can apply all the sorts of, you know, spectral methods that, as in like time frequency methods that we have talked about um, to the predictions that come out. So you just get a voltage time course and you can plot power spectra and look at network dynamics and, and that sort of thing. It's just as if you had recorded everywhere when in fact you only recorded from a few locations. Yeah, I mean, that's a testable, testable prediction. <laughs> well, everyone is exactly the same. Did you not know this? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, especially for these patients who are like missing parts of their brain potentially and who have, uh, you know, these are epilepsy patients that we get the data from. So and part of the criteria for them being in the hospital in the first place is that they have kind of epilepsy in non-standard places. So they're sometimes different across people. Um, so all these things factor in. Also, they have a flexibility ergo the correlation between different parts of the brain. Is that normal to begin with? Yes, absolutely. Um, yeah. And is it task dependent? Because regardless of all of these concerns. Yeah, so we've done some work looking at across task generalizability. So um, you can train this covariance model using data from one task and then make prediction, like hold that model fixed and make do brain reconstructions uh, for a different task. And you can do that uh, well, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Lucy, do you remember 
sorry to put you on the spot. Do you remember if you can, I think you can predict better within task, but I'm not, I can't remember actually. Okay, yeah, but, it, but even better than that is if you combine data within and across tasks, that, which is kind of the key thing. So basically what we found, so we've also looked at like, if you use just your brain to make predictions, can you, is that better? Uh, then if you incorporate data from other people and it's better to incorporate data from other people, which says that even though people are different, everyone is a unique snowflake, uh, you still can improve your model by including data from other unique snowflakes. And uh, also even though correlation matrices are different across tasks, because our ability to estimate them is noisy, perhaps, uh, you know, including more data is better. Yeah. Um, how, do the, uh, how do the quality of the predictions vary with the number of subsystems that are integrated? We've mainly explored that in the realm of synthetic data. Um, I. May, Lucy, maybe, yeah, 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 we have graphs on this. I fr I'm like blanking on all the numbers. And then in simulation, he, he showed you how well you can recover like the best like combinations you know, and see which ones are the right. Um, we haven't done that in like, we haven't done that in our real data in the real world. Yes, there's another, there's like several other pieces to answering that question. So it's like how many subjects do you have? How many electrodes per subject? And what proportion of the brain do you cover? And all of these knobs can be tuned independently. Uh, yes, and within and across tasks. Um, so I think that space is still kind of ripe for mining and understanding. But you know, the more coverage you have, the more patience. I mean, I do remember this at least at a very coarse level. You know, the more data, the better <laughs> is uh, kind of what you'd expect, and that's what you find, um, but exactly what that kind of cutoff is, is, you know, still a question. Uh, yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, I was just wondering if it helps at all to include lab interactions. That's another, uh, ah, that is the fourth kind of wrong assumption of our model. So we assume that information flows instantly between every pair of locations. Clearly, that's not true. So, you know, bigger wires, longer wires take longer to kind of propagate inf in information. Um, so that's something we're not trying to capture with this model. And you can imagine using kind of white matter track lengths or something like that to build in some kind of idea of lag. Um, but we're not doing that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And no, we uh, filter out like 60 hertz and all the harmonics of 60 hertz, but we don't uh, do any bandpass filtering. Nope. That could be done. The uh, one of the challenges when doing these reconstructions is it results in absolutely enormous data objects. So if you imagine like what's the size of a typical fMRI data set, you might have like a thousand images and like you know tens of thousands of voxels. And for ECOG data, you get data sets from you know a hundred or so voxel or you know voxels, they're electrodes, um, and you have much faster sampling rates. So the data sets end up being around the same size as a typical you know, fMRI data set. Here, we basically either lose or win, depending on whether you care about like buying hard drives or care about lots of data. Uh, you have fMRI spatial resolutions, but ECOG sampling rates. So, you know, we routinely have like many terabyte files for every person. Um, and then we might have hundreds of people in our data set. So, the data sets get pretty big. Um, and if you separately do these calculations for different frequency bands, like you can imagine parameter blow up where you're like, 
well, let's look at how theta correlates with gamma in the rest of the brain. Or let's just, even if you just do the analysis in like five frequency bands, that's five times the amount of kind of stuff we need to store. And so our simplification to make this tractable is we just reconstruct the voltages, and then you can do any kind of spectral analyses on top of that, but for all the reasons raised, you know, Sorry. that may not... Well, this aside, yes. going back to the plants over, so there's a very simple thing to do, which is you look at the color, some correlation matrix that you got, some mm -hmm. virus matrix that you got, and then you try the same thing with, I don't know, five different little bad hat filtering, and then you see which one corresponds to the one that you got out most. So if it is yeah. the case that some particular thing is running the show, then it might actually be worth it to add your huge bank of data yeah. by four times more <laughs> to have actually pre make the predictions according to the frequency in which correlation between two nodes might happen, if that makes sense. But like, yeah. just to test it scientifically, you don't need to do it on everyone. It's, it's enough to have like a subsample just to see what is the one that is driving the show, or is that one, or is it? Yep, that's a great idea. Yeah, we've also thought about using like broadband power, which is a correlate of neural firing, and so that is another way of kind of factoring out the uh, spectrum shape. But do you have any mutations right now? Or is the covariance matrix driven by location too? Um, or losing it is driving. I. Uh, I It makes sense. Yeah, I mean, generally, low frequency correlations are, they uh, persist for longer spatial constants. So um, makes sense that this could be, and, and certainly they're a bigger part of the signal. So yeah, I believe, believe this. Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's kind of our view. Is that yes, like almost every aspect of this model is, like most of the models we work with in neuroscience is imperfect, and you could be improved on. Um, this is, well, there. So first of all, we think this is still a useful tool despite its, you know problems and ways it could be improved. And second of all, for this tutorial, it's a good illustration of Gaussian process uh, regression, um, which is kind of the main purpose of the tutorial. But we can also, I mean, yeah, I'm, I, I love talking about this method. But yes, I agree with like all, all of the criticisms and uh, ideas for improvement that have been raised so far. And you know, there are thousands of others. Yeah. Yeah, all, all of these things are testable empirically. So you can say, does cross-validation, you know, cross-validated accuracy improve when you build in assumption X versus relax assumption X or whatever. So, yeah. Can you make any more advanced conversation in general? But is the goal to take, populate a group doing the analysis in just group states? Or is it to like, populate a group space and then sort of like get recover from that with this filled in thing yeah. that we constantly So one of the questions that drove the development of this method is just almost a curiosity, like how redundant is our brain? Um, so if I put a wire here, how much can I tell about how the, what the rest of the brain is doing? And if everywhere in our brain was totally independent, you would not be able to tell anything about the rest of the brain. And it's really interesting to me that 
it's perhaps not surprising, but it's interesting that our brain is so redundant and interconnected that you can actually stick a wire here and predict over here, you know, relatively well what the rest of the brain is doing. I think that's just like neuroscientifically an interesting thing. Another application of this work is that in ECOG, basically every patient gets kind of, it's not really random, but you could model it as kind of a random smattering of electrode locations. And because they're different across people, it's really hard to train models that work across subjects. And so this sort of method is one way of projecting everyone into a common space. So you say, well, let's try to predict what's happening at this common set of brain regions, even though those predictions are not perfect and bringing in all the caveats that have been raised. And then you can start to train models across people and see if you can like decode better or make better predictions. Or um, a common thing to do in ECOG is you kind of do your analysis individually for every subject and then you stitch together a map at the end and that's what goes in your paper. This approach kind of flips the order of things. So you're doing the stitching before you do your analysis. Then you do your analysis on every subject individually, just like with fMRI, and then you stitch together across subjects at the end, but you have the single subject results to fall back on. So the answer you get out at the very last step of the analysis is going to be similar to the just look at one piece of brain and stitch at the end, but the intermediate steps are potentially useful and interesting. And uh, you know, if you want to look at full brain network dynamics on like a single trial, single person level, you need a method like this. Because if you only record from this piece of brain, you can't know what the rest of the brain is doing without having some way of filling it in. Yeah. Can you actually explain that intuition? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So given that you know, OK. So the intuition is pretty cool. So OK. So the kind of, oops, I have magnetic erasers in my lab, and that is definitely not magnetic. Uh, <laughs> it's so it's just like people are different, erasers can also be different. <laughs> but it actually was a pretty good model because, yeah, no. Um, like it didn't travel that far in absolute distance. <laughs> no. Uh, OK, say this is your correlation matrix. And uh, sorry, I'll. Uh, OK. So you have E electrodes and T time points. And, the, and I've sorted the columns of this matrix so that all the locations you know about are the set of locations alpha, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to number of electrodes in this subject's brain. And then the set of locations that I want to know about are beta, different locations. Location. So I never observe anything in the beta columns. Does that make sense? OK. Now, the full brain covariance matrix tells me how every location is correlated with every other location. And so I can sort the rows and columns in the same way. So this quadrant here tells me how all the locations in alpha are related to all the other locations in alpha. And then this quadrant here tells me how all the betas are related. And I can't learn that from this subject's brain because I don't have any data there, but I can learn it from other people's brains. And this, then these quadrants tell me how alpha and beta are related. Does that make sense? OK. Given that, ah, there's one more trick, which is that to make the math a little bit easier and simpler, you can z-score all the columns of this matrix. So every column is going to have zero mean and uh, unit covariance. So it's just going to be, or sorry, not unit covariance, uh, unit standard deviation. So correlations and covariances mean the same thing, and everything is zero centered. Okay. Does that make sense? Everyone knows what z-scoring is. You subtract the mean, divide by the standard, devi devi standard deviation. Okay. Um, if you don't mean center everything, you have to 
factor that in in this formula. Okay. So the idea is we let's call this matrix Y, and then this matrix is K for covariance spelled wrong, um, and then this part is <laughs> K alpha alpha, and this is like K alpha beta. Does that make sense? Okay. So the formula is you say. Okay, well, I'll get rid of the hats here. You don't need hats. I don't know what this mu is. Maybe that's something I drew before. Okay, yes. Can you observe the same error like those across these other equations and averaging? Yes, so you very rarely do you get location, electrodes in exactly the same locations, and you, and you never get electrodes in exactly the same pair of locations. But if we do get electrodes in exactly the same location. Because the way we localize these things is by kind of plotting the nearest voxel on like a one millimeter standard brain. So we know within a millimeter where these voxels are, where these electrodes are. So every so often by that rounding, we do get things in the same location and we just average. Yeah. <laughs> yes, would be the short answer to your question. Uh, okay. So, uh, Well, here's the formula. You uh, take all the places you know, okay? You know what, it, it's some, do we have, we don't have another chalk color, okay? I'm gonna prove this out by the law of if the dimensions match up, then the math has to be right. Okay, um, <laughs> this is a T by E matrix. Okay, we take the transpose, okay, well, I'm going to be a little sloppy with my notation. Alpha is going to be overloaded. It both means the set of locations I know about and also the number of locations I know about. Is that okay? Okay. I could put like length symbols, but then it'll make things sloppier. Okay. Okay. So this is a, it starts out as a time by length of alpha matrix. Transpose it, it becomes an alpha by time matrix. Okay. This is an alpha by alpha matrix, and I'm going to invert it. Why? Well, we'll talk about it. <laughs> this is a beta by alpha matrix. Okay. So if you multiply a beta by alpha matrix times an alpha by alpha matrix, what's the size of the result? Does anyone remember linear algebra? Beta, beta by alpha, because the inner things cancel. Beta by alpha, and if you multiply a beta by alpha by alpha by t, what's the result? What's this? Beta by t. And then we transpose it. <laughs> t by beta, and look, this is t by beta. <laughs> Q-E-D. Yeah, great. OK. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so what's the intuition? So you've got your, this is a very rough intuition, but the idea is you've got, okay, it's a little confusing because of parenthetical groupings, but this is how it works. Okay, you've got your data. Multiplying, which is at all the recordings at location alpha. Multiplying by the inverse of the covariance matrix of these, this data effectively whitens it. And then we multiply by how those locations co-vary with the locations we care about. And that projects it back onto the beta locations that we do care about, and then transpose to get the things in the right orientation, and that gives us our prediction. Now, what it's effectively doing to make these predictions is every column of Y beta is going to be a linear combination of the columns of y alpha. So that's how the predictions are made, for better or for worse. So is that actually how different pieces of our brain happen? No. But that's how this model works. That's what we did. And the inverse. This inverse? That's the whitening thing. So 
this has covariance k alpha alpha. So when we multiply this by the inverse of its own covariance matrix, it whitens it. So it turn so the covariance matrix might be some kind of oriented ellipse. Whitening it turns it into a like a sphere. And then we're projecting it back out to have covariance beta alpha, which is another oriented ellipse in a different direction. And then that it basically says what linear recombination of the columns of alpha give me the appropriate entries of this correlation matrix, you know, as best as I can. That, and this formula is Gaussian process regression. Uh, nothing like non-trivial. Yeah, but yeah, this is a <coughs> neat, in my opinion, research question, and like in totally ripe for applying all of these ideas. Like everyone could pick one of these ideas. It would take you at least a year of work to do it and then to like test it out properly and then that would be a paper and then we'd have like a thousand papers and then we'd still have like a thousand more questions for each paper so it's a generative you know <laughs> a generative process no it is a uh, you know deep research area and deep research questions Well, all the things that have come up, I think, are great critiques. Um, in my other than what we said, there must be some idea because I've heard concerns from the current people about this. Mm. But I want to know if you have particular things that you think are advantages. I mean, I think it could be just different. In which case, would you say like? Yeah. Um, I don't know, I'm happy to address a specific concern if you want to bring one up. Or... Yeah. That's definitely all I wanted to cover. Yeah. Cool. All right. Yes. Please go through the notebook. If you are interested, feel free to find me and, uh, and ask me questions. Or if you go through it after you leave, email. Um, We've had, we have a preprint out with all the kind of math details, and we're in the process of revising this thing and applying it to more data sets and testing it ever more better. Haven't tested on animal data. If you want us to test it on your animal data and you think it's kind of, yes? Have you tested NEGs? Like nope. Nope. Yeah. yeah. Also, great. Yeah, we could do source localization and EEG. We're, uh, our plan is to test this on fMRI data also um, and like, you know, simulate. No, no, no. Holding out, oh, okay. F, holding out yeah. voxels and then reconstructing them and then we really do know the ground truth. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thank